At today's episode of Among the Clouds, I'm talking to Mike Van Portfleet from the band Lycia. Mike is responsible for some of my favorite albums of all time. It was an honor to talk to him and pick his brain with questions I've had for almost 30 years. Stay tuned. Uh, hey, Mike, uh, thanks for doing the show. Um, I'm a huge fan going back as far as, I don't know, 93 or so. Um, we've met briefly at a show in 95. I've seen you guys live a few times, um, collected a bunch of stuff of yours through the years um, to the point where I've even made a bootleg Ionia shirt at one point when my original one <laughs> died and before reissue of one. Um, anyway, thanks for doing the show. Hey, it's a pleasure. I've interviewed friends. I've interviewed, uh, bands I'm fans with, but, uh, interviewing you and just Lycia in general, um, I call it Lycia. Is that how you pronounce it? That's exactly right. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, you're the first person I've interviewed where your band is actually like changed my life in some way not to make it like you know crazy uh you know blow smoke up your ass or anything like that but in all honesty when i told a few friends uh that you agreed to do the show they all said oh man you gotta be shitting your pants so i was like you know it, it it's super cool that with today's technology and stuff that something like this could even happen you know we've always sort of lived in our own little hole and so from our perception, you know, we, we've never seen that we've really accomplished much of many things except for just having a few albums out here and there. Um, we've always been pretty isolated. So, you know, it's nice to hear stuff like what you just said. It's flattering. Yeah, I mean, when I discovered um, Lycia, funnily enough, it was, and I wrote it down because one of my questions is, is, is about this was, um project records put out they had some compilations called uh what was it from across this gray land mm -hmm. and i believe it was volume three was the first thing i bought from project and i'd only seen ads in a couple like goth type magazines like propaganda or ghastly or something at that time and project always had like the coolest artwork you know like in their ads and i was like I don't even know what this stuff sounds like, but I have to buy some of it because the, the artwork was just so amazing. Um, but I found that compilation. So the first song I heard by you was Everything is Cold, but it was the acoustic with Will Welch's, um, like, a, a, was it acoustic bass or fretless bass? Fretless bass, yeah. And right. um, back in that time period, we, I think we released too many comp songs back then. Um, I don't think we put the same amount of attention into the comp songs as we did the album. So I've always heard that as a bit of a rushed version. Um, so I'm surprised you were like, well, I want to check this band out more after hearing that version of it. Well, it's actually my favorite version because I heard it first. Yeah. Um, out of that whole compilation, there was maybe three or four bands that I really wanted to check out that I ended up becoming hugely fans of, like Soul Willing Somewhere, um, love spirals downwards by Sia. Um, so when I was able to find an album, I, th I think Dana Star Corner had just come out pretty soon before, or, you know, right before that. And I found that on cassette tape. <laughs> and my best friend Kevin had found Ionia on cassette tape. So he bought one, I bought one. You know, I remember where we were when we both put them on. And we were both looking at each other. And my first thought was, wow, this is nothing like that song. You know, the, <laughs> the, that version of Everything is Cold. So at first I was kind of confused of, wow, this, that song did not represent these guys at all. But it took like a minute to acclimate myself. But it was such a cool sound. Um, there's really no other band that sounds like you guys. But real fast, I did want to ask, why are there so many versions of everything is cold. There's at least four versions that I know of. I think the, 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 the real version is on Stark Corner. Mm -hmm. um, the version that's on Greyland number three 
um, project was preparing the comp and I didn't really have any material at the time. And there was a, a bit of um, turmoil in the band at the time. Will was involved in the band. And it, right around that time, he was getting ready to bolt and not be involved anymore. And um, as I said earlier, I think we did way too many comp songs. A lot of times the comp songs were throwaways. And for the very reason that you just mentioned there, a lot of times our comp songs didn't really represent what we were, what I was doing at the time, but before what John Fair and I were doing. Mm -hmm. um, so the reason there were two versions originally was that there was the album version and I, I needed a comp song. And I was sort of wrapped up into trying to salvage a day in the start corner because that was an album that nearly um, came apart and I nearly quit music. It was just a really, the mood of the music was, very accurate to how I was at the time. So it was a real touch and go time. Um, and I wasn't sure if I was going to just walk away from music. In terms of the other two versions, um, there's the version on live, which right. um, really just came about when um, we were at Sam Rosenthal's house uh, um, during the tour, a day off. And Dave Gallus and I were just you know, rehearsing some of the songs and we just decided to mess around with that. And I said, Hey, can you play that on the piano? And so he, he just did it and Sam taped it right. and it, a bit different. And we thought, Hey, let's just throw it on the end of live. And probably more interesting, the version on cold came about when we were right in the middle of the cold sessions. And I did not want to make the same mistake that I had made in the past and just thrown out a half finished song or an outtake to a comp because I wanted the comp song to more represent what we were doing, but um, we didn't really have any additional cold song. So I thought, well, everything is cold, cold. Let's just <laughs> revamp it as if we were working it for the cold album. And right. so it really is part of the cold sessions. And I, I really like that version. Too. It's a well thought out version. So my, my two favorite versions would be the proper album version and that version. Um, the Greyland um, three version, I'm not too fond of. And the live version, yeah, it's all right. I'm, I'm not a big fan of the live album either with the exception of Last Thoughts Before Sleep. So I think the early days were sort of hit or miss at times. Yeah, because when I got the... Um, the live album that was the first time I had saw David's name associated with it you know mm -hmm. um, I don't think the Bleak album was out yet or is coming very soon after that um, so that was the first time I saw his um, name associated with it and I was like oh who's this guy you know the band formed in 88 right it formed in 88 um, officially right um, but the concept really goes back to August 1981. I was a very aloof person at that time. And when I started doing music, I had this idea of what I wanted to do, but I was just not ready to be firm with my ideas. So I sort of, um, Lycia sort of um, floated around in the background in a number of bands I played in from um, 81 to 84, and then also in 86 and 87. Um, coming out in live shows as the instrumental song or a break here or there, but you know, I I was very um, unsure about how the, my other band members would take to the material I was working on because a lot of times I'd bring in a song, and I'd have a very clear idea of what I wanted to do. But it was a different time back then, and so by the time the song actually got finished, it was completely changed to something different. And I sort of took that as a sign that no one really was digging in the ideas that I was bringing in. So <laughs> very apprehensive about pushing forward with the band. So. 88 is when it, it took off and it, it took off at a point when John Fair and I, I'd worked with John going back to 1982, we were sort of just fed up. So I got a four track and we said, we're just going to record. Let's just be a studio band. Let's record and just focus in on that. And, um, and that's when things really started to roll. And it's easy to be confident when you're just hiding in your room at, sure. uh, in the middle of the night just with the uh, uh, recording equipment and you're just mixing your ideas. And, and um, but it, it really, it took off pretty quickly from that point on. 
you do wake for me the wake is the wake cd you know that has the extra songs on it but i know it was originally like an eight song thing but i'm also a huge fan of i don't even know what you would call it but all the demos and whatnot um i call it the ghosts of lycia but for years i had most of those songs downloaded from i want to say it was like a lycia.com or something for maybe like 15 years ago or 20 years ago or something like that i can't um, remember where i put those up at i don't know if it, it might have been when we still maintain the web page i think it, it was on one of those. i know when i um was uh, collecting those it was probably the early 2000s and, right and i'm glad you brought bring this up because to me um most people see like see a starting with Ionia and that's the beginning, but that was, that wasn't for me. It wasn't the beginning. I started back in 81 and I went through a whole progression of bands. And by the time we got to, I got to Ionia, it was, you know, my ideas were already really quite mature and, and evolved at that point in time. Mm -hmm. By the time we, we had, I had done Star corner, it felt like it was the end of the line, but I always had a soft spot for, the music that John and I did in the late eighties, because I felt it was very vibrant. Um, it was probably some of the most pure music I ever did, but um, we were very sloppy in our recording at the time. Um, you know, it, we were, we were way too, too much drinking and too much other things at the time and very sloppy. Um, and it was manic. I, I mean, what, what you hear in all those collected demos is probably about a quarter of what we actually did. Um, we lost a lot of master tapes. Um, we lost tons of mix down tapes. Um, we literally just wrote a song and moved on. And our philosophy was, oh, if we ever get a deal or anything, we'll just come back and re-record that stuff. Sure. That later came back to really haunt us because when you're you're moving at such a pace like that and you're living in such a reckless lifestyle, um, when the time actually came to re-record stuff, um, we had forgotten pretty much everything we had done. We had not taken notes. I, right. I you know, we didn't even have the tempo. Um, John, John actually even erased the drum machine parts because we were just on to the next song, on to the next song. So when we initially started working on Wake, the the idea was that we were going to recreate a number of our, our our favorite songs from the demos, and it just did not go well. And so we did what we had been doing is we just wrote mostly new songs. That was just a a lost opportunity for both of us. Um, I think if we would have captured that material properly, I, I think the perception of Lycia might be very different than it is now because we were we were very guitar. I mean, we were a guitar based drum machine band. Right. And the vantage point we were coming at the time was we wanted to be part Cocteau Twins, part Big Black. Sure. So and we I can hear that. Somehow after that, as things sort of crumbled, and I came out working alone. I ended up, you know, sending demos to Project. And next thing you know, I was under the understanding that I was a goth band. And I, and I at the time was like, goth? What you mean, like, like Christian death? I mean, I didn't. I, didn't, <laughs> I firmly, firmly, firmly have post punk roots. Yeah, I mean, you were associated in definitely one foot in that whole scene because. It was magazines like Pro Propaganda and Ghastly and whatnot that was promoting um, project stuff. But I don't think none of my friends or anybody I knew heard you guys and thought you were a goth band. I mean, it was more to us, you were more associated with Joy Division meets Slow Dive or something because the guitar synth and, and whatever was, you know what I mean? But you was definitely doing your own thing. Like I, nobody was ever saying, you know, you sounded like anybody. I've never heard anybody say you guys sound like anybody. I think um, your definition there is perfect because that's the angle in the early 90s that I personally was coming from. I still, <clears throat> you know, Joy Division, Your Shirt, Killing Joke. I love bands like um, Slow Dive. What, what what John and I were studying out to do, we wanted to make big atmospheric music, but I wasn't setting out to be like full of angst. 
I think that just happened because of the time and the situation. We, we never talked about super dark music back then. We always talked about reflective music. Like see, it went from being like a reflective band to moving almost into this existential territory. And it doesn't help either when you're, you're following a really unhealthy lifestyle and, and it feeds on itself. And pretty soon you're just off and things are dark everywhere around you. And then you just funnel it, funneling it into the music. And, you know, that, that be, it starts feeding on itself. And then, sure. So that's why from songs, some of those demos that John and I worked on were pretty dark, but then it just really, really went to, it finally reached its peak, I think, and start corner. I mean, I would say the demo songs or whatever we want to call them and including wake, they're definitely a different period from Ionia, you know, uh, there's, that's definitely, I mean, it sounds like you're using a different drum machine for sure. There's, uh, there's bass, um, the keyboards really aren't there. Um, the drum machine has more like double or triplet or bass kick drum patterns. Um, you know, it's drier. There's clean guitars. Like, is it from foam maybe, uh, with clean guitars? Um, so it's definitely a different, uh, more stripped down version. And that's why I love those early demo songs. Cause it's, I know you say the production's not that great or whatever, but there is like a, uh, a personality to it or, or whatever. And it's, it's great because yes, it could sound like a demo or whatever, but it's also amazing what you were able to accomplish with just how stripped down it is that it does have that atmosphere that it does do its job, if that makes sense. It does make sense. Those songs live and breathe the time they were made. They're like mm -hmm. pure. And because of that, I love those songs. And I think um, it's one of the most accurate, emotionally accurate period in Lyceum. You know, maybe uh, it's one of my favorite periods. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I love the stuff. I, I mean, I break it out, you know, ever since the early 2000s or whatever, when you had it on the website, I mean, I remember listening to them and going, man, why weren't these ever released? You know, like some of the, some of the songs are just, they're freaking amazing. You know, I know you're not a fan of Ionia. I get it. I've seen all your videos about it and, and uh, where you talk about it and everything. But uh, one thing I want to say, I mean, it's my personal favorite for probably a lot of reasons why it's not, you don't like it, but it, it's its own entity. It's its own atmosphere from start to finish. It takes you on a journey. Um, there's nothing else like it. Um, it was before I got into like ambient music or there's like, there's a lot of instrumental stuff on there, but it was stuff that put me in that mindset of what ambient music later would do or like do you know who sea feel is mm -hmm. the repetition you know the the um that kind of zones you out and that was ionia to me put me in a state of mind that i would discover other bands later who obviously don't sound like ionia but did that late you know the, the repetition the the loops or whatever and the dreaminess of it and the fact that you did that on a four track still just blows my mind. And the fact that you could do that, make an album on a four track and get all these sounds. It was very inspiring to us because it was like, how is this guy doing this? You know? Um, but that, that album definitely has an atmosphere to it. And that's singular to just that. And then burning circle. That's when I think you got, that's probably more shoegaze stuff you know like when prey came out when i heard prey i was like oh dude this is going to be on the radio i've turned so many people who only know shoegaze or whatever or even the cure you know what i mean um i've played them prey and every one of them's like jaw on the floor but yeah i just i felt like you were really on something and then the fact that it was a double album and you put out the bleak album at the same time basically yeah, you guys are on a roll as far as how Very many, how much music. First of all, um, my opinion on both um, Ionia and Stark Corner has vastly changed. And it really has a lot to do with the remasters that Martin from Attrition did on both of them. It, it, it really 
he he really brought them out to being what I wanted them to be. I think you have to go back to the '90s and how things were mastered back then. You know, you didn't have um, you didn't look at the waveforms. I mean, you went in the studio right. and they ran it through a compressor and they looked for the peak. You know, when you're flooding everything with reverb, you get these false peaks, these reverb peaks, and so Lycia was always quieter than every other band. Whenever we were on a various artist comp, we were always consistently lower. And it, it bothered me because it made me feel as though our music sounded cheaper. And so that really flavored how I perceived those albums. But I tell you, um, the version of Ionia that came out in Avant Garde, um, the vinyl version, when I listened to that, my opinion completely changed. It just oh, boomed up. It was everything that I always wanted it to be. It's it's amazing how just differences in EQs and levels can just really bring out something. Um, that that, that version is going to be the definitive version. It's um, when I heard the master the mastering that Martin did on that, I thought this is this is what I always wanted it to be, and um, and somehow, some way, just because of the limitations of of um, mastering back then, it just it didn't get it. And plus I've known Martin for a long time. And so right. it's really nice to have somebody to work on your music that is very familiar with what you're doing and cares about it. So that comes out too. In terms of Burning Circle, yeah. Um, we're, Lycia is a, a band that is always morphing. I think it's really funny that there's this perception that Lycia has this sound because I have such a short attention span. I'm bouncing around from this to that. And so, in the in the mid '90s, you know, I couldn't help but be influenced by what was going on with the shoegaze. Um, I had two roommates, and one of the roommates was in half string, and mm -hmm. it was all around me. And I like shoegaze, um, and because of my guitar roots back to the, um, the the mid '80s, when you know you look at what shoegaze bands were influenced by, it's the same stuff I was influenced by back right. in the uh, early and mid '80s. And I really, I wanted to return back to the guitar. Guitar is my main instrument and the keyboards really sort of took over for a few albums. And I wanted a, a, a return back to guitar. And um, initially the Burning Circle was gonna be a single album. What you hear on disc one was the album. But we had so many other additional songs that we were working on, um, we decided to do a double disc. That's why disc one has a definite flow and style and disc two is a little more varied um disc two is just sort of the odds and, and ends extras that we recorded in the same sessions um like a song like gray clouds which is amazing from the bleak album i mean there's no reason why that couldn't have fit on burning circle you know what i mean um mm -hmm. I remember at the time you saying like, this is more of our industrial harsher thing or whatever. And I get that there's more uh, harshness to it. But to me, I mean, it's always just been another Lycia album. Uh, initially, that was going to be a Lycia album. It was going to be Stark Corners follow up. And then Burning Circle was going to sort of be a continuation of Wake, even though it went completely different because instead of it being reflective back to the late 80s, it tuned itself right into that time frame of the early 90s and mm -hmm. you know, a lot of the bands that were around then so bleak is also an amazing like name though too i mean the fact that it wasn't even used yet <laughs> i mean come on so yeah I, I, I at the time i used to think well maybe this should be the ba main band name but um <laughs> it just got reabsorbed back into the band i'm, I'm happy that you're appreciating those albums now it's got to feel good it's got to be some sort of gift to be able to do that so many years later and appreciate these things um see them in a new light in the beginning what came first becoming a musician or hearing something like joy division or or tones on tail or something at Bauhaus and saying okay I'm gonna get a guitar and I'm gonna write songs what came first I'm assuming you were playing guitar first but this is what I ask people <laughs> no actually it's the opposite oh um, okay the music and showing my age um late 60s mm -hmm. four-year-old version of myself being absolutely 
hypnotized by the doors. Even at that age, I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to make music. And from that point on, I was a music fanatic and went through the whole progression that you usually hear people maybe from the punk generation. I went through that same progression. When I first started playing the guitar, you know, I, I was probably um, wanting to be uh, like the Ramones because it was the late seventies. Right. And then, then I started hearing the initial post-punk bands, um, in particular, the very first PIL song, Public Image. And I thought, it's such oh, a good song. This is a genre made for me, not only in regards to the different mood, but the different approach to playing the guitar, because I'm not a rock and roll guitar player. From the time I heard that song, my direction changed. I no longer wanted to play punk or be in a punk band. I wanted to do music like that. And in very short order after that, I heard bands like Wire, Joy Division, and even since stuff like Gary Newman, the mm -hmm. mood of that stuff. I, this, is, this is my music. This is what I want to do. And, and so before I actually ever was in a band, that was the stuff that I was absolutely obsessed with going back to the late 70s. And I still, if I had to pick one era of music that's my favorite, it's still that initial post-punk period. I, I love it. And at what point are you saying, I can write a song? And at what point did you discover your voice? I started writing songs as soon as I started playing the guitar. Um, in terms of my voice, go, I go back to what I said earlier, where I had this idea for the band in 81, but I was petrified to hear my voice a musical note note come out of my own voice. <laughs> sure. I would I was still living with my parents then and no one would be at the house and I'm still embarrassed to sing. I just couldn't do it. I would write I would write um lyrics and I would hear them in my head but I was petrified. Um I think one of the reasons my voice sounds the way it does when I sing is that when I initially started singing in the late 80s and that's when I first started singing, I was so restrained. I was so afraid to just let it go right? that it came out sounding maybe more raspy. I mean, it's definitely a unique voice. I, I think I started singing. Um, it was somewhere between a whisper and something musical. So it's whispered. It's still whispered, but it, there's still musical notes in there. Right. But You're think, still singing a note. Right. You know, Stark Corner and Ionia, I was still very restrained in my singing and you know i would eventually have to have to do it because you know you can't just half-ass it and then say oh there you know so it was but it was a struggle it was a real struggle after the um the um 93 tour the start corner tour um there was me, me and dave gallus practiced quite a bit and then we did the tour and then we immediately went into the studio and did bleak and the burning circle and it was during that period that I started really getting comfortable with my voice. Real fast, where did the crazy amount of reverb on the drum machine come from? Because it seemed like um, at that time, you were pushing the reverb on the drum machine more than anybody else. It came from, of all things, the desire to be heavy. Mm. Um, back in the um, very late 80s, I would sort of alternate from working with John Fair to working with Will Welsh. Mm -hmm. Will Welsh came from a, a very different background than John and I. John and I came from the post-punk. Will Welsh came from um, underground metal who had moved on to grow, grow, get an appreciation for industrial music and Killing Joke. We wanted to be the slowest band in the world. And we wanted the drums to be bigger and heavier than any metal band. So okay. when you have minimal drums like that, you can crank that reverb up. And right. so that sort of, sort of stuck with me when I started working on the slower stuff for Ionia and Start Corner. I was really into that approach at that time. Sort of funny considering that we were a band that was heavily influenced by ambient music, but by the same token, we wanted to be loud and heavy. After Wake was done, um, John left the band. He had an opportunity to uh, join up with an, another band that was on a major label and, and tour the United States and tour Japan. So um, it was unsure of what his involvement was going to be in Lycia from that point on. And shortly after he left, 
I got the deal, I got the offer from Project based on our early demos that we sent. Well, John was off touring and Project wanted us to do an album. And so I recruited Will to maybe help me brainstorm on how to do it. And next thing you know, Will and I are working on this heavy album. It's gonna be on Project. But what ended up happening was um, we had problems with the mix. It's funny because we both sort of wanted the same thing. It's like one of those arguments where you're arguing, arguing with somebody and but we both want the same thing, but are blaming the other person for the same thing. He didn't want to be involved anymore and I didn't want to continue with it. So I went and reinvented the release and it became Ionia. You have like your own sound. So how did you come up with the gear, the sound with limited knowledge and, you know, were you just using chorus and delays or what were you what were you using it was just a continuation of the effects that i used in the 80s which was um i used this old distortion fuzz box a company called austin it's a real cheapy one but it was real real dirty sounding and then um an ibanez um digital delay and the ibanez chorus i i was never shy about cranking them <laughs> and then my guitar, I'd put two guitar tracks on the four track and um, um, use that same combination of effects I mentioned earlier, but just tweak it a little bit. And it really just came with sort of a, a, a not holding back style of playing or, you know, really bending the strings and, and just a lot of the sound is it's more than the effects it's the way i played the guitar were the guitars always going direct was there ever a mic and amp always direct to this day they're direct the only thing i've ever miked in lycia was the acoustic guitars the last few years it's always just about the effects and it's always been direct and um in fact i had a real struggle i changed my effects in the um in the 2000s and um, it was really weird because i had gone from using foot pedals for years and years and then in the mid 90s late 90s i used a, a couple rack mount effects um a digitech multi-effects and then a lexicon for big pitched reverbs and then i went to a, a, a boss multi-effects unit in the 2000s and i really struggled with it for a while because of all those amp simulations didn't stand them it just <laughs> I, I, but no mm -hmm. i've never been a Amp oriented. How has your songwriting changed? Like, are you ever worried about, or are you ever thinking about song structures? I come from, uh, my background is song oriented. It always has been. I always think in terms of verses and chorus and breaks, intros, extras. When I write a song, I, I really don't think, I let the song go where, it, where it's gonna go. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I'm very cognizant of the fact that this, it's what I do is still writing songs. Dave, John, and I all come from backgrounds that are completely song structured. And so um, the single that um, John and I have coming out on Avant Garde, which is very old school, 80s sounding stuff. I'm really excited about this single. Um, it's taking a chance. Um, I mean, we're releasing a synth pop song on a metal label. Hey, but... I, we've always, we, I always like to take chances and we, we've had backlashes before. I mean, the, the transition from, you know, start corner and bleak to um, burning circle, the first few weeks that burning circle was off, I heard nothing but bad things. Um, I was criticized quite heavily amongst a, a circle of musician friends. I guess with friends like that who needs enemies. Um, and I was pretty roundly accused of being a, a pretty hardcore sellout. And I thought I'm accused of being a sellout when I completely go outside of my comfort zone and push the band in a completely new direction. I, I didn't see it as a sellout. I thought I was, you know, I was moving it in, in a direction that felt natural to me. I wasn't trying to sell records. I just was right. expanding what we do. Production wise. Um, it was more, more clear. Um, but I never, I never saw it as selling out or anything. For me, I always just thought it was kind of the natural thing you were going to do. Like I said earlier, I thought Prey was going to be like the starting point of what you were going to do next. Once you get by that, that, that first shock, which some of the people did, um, then it lessened up. And, it, you know, and then it was received pretty well. The album was received really well in the, in the press. And 
And we got some um, interesting opportunities from that, doing some you know bigger tours. And um, it opened a lot of doors that led, led to better things down the line. Are you still using a real drum machine? It's a combination of stuff. Um, for the last few releases, um, when I program drums, I still use the same Alesis drum machine. I have a newer Alesis drum machine, but I like the old one better. Dave um, uses what, I don't know what Dave uses. He just probably uses, Dave always has tons of equipment. So Dave just right. uses what Dave has. And John, um, he does everything um, on a, a software synth. Are you still recording start to finish? Or are you starting to record? when you get the original idea and you're like, okay, I'll finish this song over time. You know what I mean? How, how's your process? Is it the same or has it changed? It's changed. Um, I, I still will work on a song from beginning to end in, in a skeletal form, but as it's coming together, um, uh, you know, I'll concentrate in different parts and I, you know, I do a lot of cut and paste too. By doing it that way, I think it opens other doors for me to um, be a little bit more experimental in other ways. There's been times where, um, like on um, in Flickers, where I've gotten something from Dave and I just start piecing piecing things together um, mm -hmm. and trying some stuff for, for something that maybe we didn't think was going to work out, and I just start cutting paste. But other times, you know, it's it it var I'll just say it varies. It depends on the right. song. It can be anywhere from. I've written a complete song on acoustic guitar with with acoustic guitar and vocals, I record to a click track, and then fill in the other elements, the drums and the bass and electric guitar afterwards. Or it can be where I just sample one part of either something I wrote or something that Dave or John wrote and start looping it and experimenting, and then it, it morphs from there. So it's all over the board. When you're recording your your guitars, are you still doing effects into the DAW, into the recording software, or are you adding delays and reverbs and stuff or choruses or whatever after the fact now? I mean, has, that, has that changed, I guess? It never changed and it never will. Um, I'm a firm believer of record what you play, practice um, because that affects how I play. Mm -hmm. You know, you work hard to develop your sound. Mm -hmm. You have it that way. Record. And I think if I played super clean, it would. I'd feel more restrained, and I think the music would come out sounding really sterile. I want it to sound like it sounds when you're you, you're messing with your effects, and it's loud, and it's uh, bouncing all over the place. And so, I not only record my guitars that way, I record the synths that way. I run this. I always run the synths to guitar effects. Um, mm. Every musical instrument that we record, it's all of us will will pre effect. It's just the way you know. It's just the way we prefer to do it. Well, let's talk a minute about the seven inch. Um, why just the two songs? Uh, how did this come about? And I could be wrong, but it seemed like the drums were more of like a wake type programming. But maybe that was just all in my head. No, I, exactly what it was. I can give this a quick summary on this. Cause I, I could go on for this for a long time. Sure. Um, it goes back to those demos. It really does. And I've always felt those demos were a lost opportunity and a lost time for me. And so I've always wanted to sort of replicate that feel and that vibe. And John and I started working on together on and off around the burning circle and dust. Me and him did the dust sessions. Those songs became very much, more of that of that time and place as opposed to going back to the old style so it didn't it didn't scratch that itch tried mm -hmm. it again with empty space that was just that didn't work out at all either so i just sort of gave up on that we would ever be able to revisit that time and then when i was able to find the original lost versions of wake and we we um, were able to remaster that that really made me feel satisfied that we revisited the old days but what ended up happening was um, I was working on the initial songs for In Flickers, and John sent me a couple synth, synth songs that he wanted me to um, play on for a solo project he was doing. And I heard them, and it's, it, it, they, they struck me in the same spirit as those old songs. So I'm like, I'm, give me a shot at these. Maybe we'll do these for Lyceum. And they became missed in a failure for um, 
in Flickers. And by the way, a failure has had, has since become the biggest Lycia song ever. I mean, it yeah. it gets only plays on Spotify. I'm shocked, but it still does really well. But that song really captured the spirit of the old days. And so when we finished in Flickers, I wasn't really sure if we were going to do anything else. Um, at this stage, being around so long, every release feels like it's going to be the last one to me. So after we finished in Flickers, um, I got nostalgic and um, asked John if he would be interested in maybe trying to give a go at recreating a couple of the old songs. We were going to try to do the guitar and bass songs, but he hadn't played bass for so many years that we decided to redo a couple synth songs. So we went ahead and did Galatea and Accept. And that, to me, it really, it really felt like we were in a time machine right back to like 1988. And so... When we finished Casa Luna, me and him briefly talked about, well, let's perhaps try to recreate a couple of the other old songs. But, you know, we that we didn't catch, catch the genie in the bottle a second time around. Mm -hmm. So I said, why don't we just give it a shot and just do a couple songs and just write them from scratch. But let's just pretend like we're in 1985 or 1984. And we'll see what happens. So trying to work it on more and maybe diluting it. It worked. Let it be. <laughs> oh, that might be the last I see a new material out there. I have nothing cooking right now. Um, this can't go on forever. What is your alternative, I guess, is what I'm asking. Well, you know, it's something I put a lot of thought into, actually. It's like I, I get sort of frustrated at times with myself because I ask myself, why does everything need to be epic? Why can't I just sit in my house and play my guitar? Why does me sitting in my house playing the guitar evolve in my mind to be in an album? Lycia had a great run in the 90s, and then we went away. Um, things really fell, fell apart for us in regards to people being, you know, following us in the very late 90s and early 2000s. We dropped right off the radar. I mean, we went from being in stores to our card being removed and, you know, really no one being interested in us. And, mm -hmm. We had a chance to have a second go around 10 years later. And so I feel fortunate and I don't want to be too greedy. I don't want to stay around too long. And so sometimes I think right outside this room, I have a, a little setup out there with my foot pedals on the floor, drum stool, my acoustic guitar, the mic stand. And I get home from work and I just turn the effects on and I play for an hour and I'm happy and I feel satisfied. And I sometimes think, Maybe that should maybe that's what I should just be doing from here on out. Our albums are being reissued and we're still getting attention, but I hate the fact that I feel like I have to do this to have it out there because it's sort of it's sort of this conflict I have is that I'm a private, aloof person. By the same token, I do stuff that I want people to hear. And sometimes mm -hmm. I just it's always been about being pure. And if it's really about being pure, shouldn't it just be me playing the guitar at home? Why do I need to have someone watch me? Or why do I need to have something out there to someone to listen to? We released our first thing in the 80s. And I'm pushing 60 now. This is one thing I can say for sure. Music will always be part of my life. Always. It's just a matter of how I orient myself towards it. I don't really feel right now, as I'm talking right now, that I need to have anything else out. But then today, I got noticed that Start Corner had arrived at Avant Garde, and in a few weeks, Simpler Times is going to arrive there. So it's really easy right. to say that when you're still having a flow of reissues come out. You know, it might be right. different. You know, I know, I know when we didn't do anything for ten years, uh, anything new, it felt pretty marvelous having cold reissued and being quiet moments you know it was great being back in the game it was great being back in the studio um but right well, now i don't feel that way yes you're getting older but i don't feel like you're losing anything that you can't do what you do um as a fan i don't hear that um if i never knew what you looked like if i didn't know how old you were none of that it still just sounds like I see it where I'm at in my life now you know it's like sometimes I feel like I keep on pushing and striving for things and sometimes I wish I could just relax I've said this every single time since start corner 
you recharge. You're away for a while. The, the, the flame reignites and one little idea turns into a album. I mean, Casa Luna is the perfect example. I, it's just the way I am. Um, I always tell everyone that this is it. And, um, and then somehow it just resurfaces again. <laughs> so <laughs> I guess when you sell all your gear, then I'll be worried. When I do an album, I give everything. And when I'm done, I feel just physically and emotionally drained. And um, you need that, you need to have that recharge. And the recharge mm -hmm. sometimes is just a reset and just being away. And sure. then you're away for a while and then, you know, new ideas percolate again and then off you go again. If you had to pick one dreamy song that you would play for somebody um, if they'd never heard, usually when I ask this question, I say, well, if you had to pick one shoegaze dream pop song uh, who, uh, by somebody who's never heard it before, and what would you pick and why? And then also, which song that you've done would you want somebody to hear and why? I'm trying to think of like like a song like Dumb Waiters by Psychedelic Furs. I don't know if that would really be considered spacey to some, but to me, it was it's a wall of atmosphere. And to me, mm -hmm. I perceive that as spacey. Um, you know, it's just sounds or the, the end of, you know, um, like like New Orders in a Lonely Place where you just have all this atmosphere and these sounds bouncing off each other. You know, I, you know, I could list a slow dive song or something like that. But I mean, if you're really asking, I would probably play one of the older songs, you know, maybe something by Echo and the Bunnymen off of Porcupine. You know, it's just, a, you know, it's just, it's just reverb and it's not as spacey as, you know, shoegaze. But to me, it's right. sort of same kind of atmosphere sure um, for Lycia um, there's a few songs that I think are defining songs for me that really are quite atmospheric I think Antarctica um, off of um, Quiet Moments is I think if I had to pick one song that was defined what I am and who I am it would be that song and it's just uh, you know the it, the way it builds and it's just waves of sound over each, and it's it's Antarctica. It's like a snowstorm. It starts with <laughs> it, it winds and it just envelops you. And that would be that, or maybe if going a little bit farther back, I think a song like Resigned. You know, it's just slow. It starts spacing and it just comes in plodding and it's spacing and it's big. But those always resonated a lot with me. So uh, thanks, Mike, for doing the show. I appreciate you uh, um, even being willing to talk to me about this stuff. Um, I've been a fan for so many years. And uh, really, other than um, maybe Justin Broderick from Godflesh and Robert Smith from The Cure, you're like one of those three people that really had an impact on my life as far as your music goes. Some of my friends who have known me since the early 90s or whatever when I told them I was uh, going to interview you or talk to you or whatever they all said oh man I know this is a huge deal for you because even if it wasn't record recording or whatever just being able to pick your mind about some things has been really great so I really appreciate you talking to me. Well thanks for having me on I, I, I definitely um, enjoy talking about the old days um, so thanks for having me on and I'd like to thank Mike for taking the time to talk to me and doing the episode. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and thanks for watching.